Welcome back. This is part two of our look at the Industrial Revolution. And as you can see in the wallpaper here on my computer, uh, that's not going to happen without the Industrial Revolution. It's a big part of why you get that. Oh, you're probably thinking I'm talking about trains. I'm actually talking about the orange. It's probably Photoshop some, right? But here in Houston, we get a pretty good orange tint in the sky quite often, especially in the summertime, and yeah, a lot of that's pollution. It's the way the particulates particulates in the air are catching the sun's rays as it's setting, kind of firing off of that. It's pretty looking, but it's probably not doing good things for, you know, for our lungs. But this is the second part of the Industrial Revolution uh, notes that I have for the initial introduction here, but... I also want to say this this part there are some key things we'll look a little bit at some basic review about why Great Britain is the lead in the Industrial Revolution but there's some overriding like uh, takeaways some factors here some things to think about certainly as far as the Industrial Revolution and um, the outcomes of it anyway or uh, emerging outcomes so we'll look at the new middlemen of trade these very competitive european nations and you can see there just uh, the amount of red traveling back and forth to the new world and then you also see so much red passing down here through uh their uh passages to get to to um, uh, india so britain's the most commercialized of europe's larger countries small farmers had been pushed out off the you know pastures and landscapes of rural uh, countrysides and into very urban densely packed cities some of this was a blessing because you do have some technical technological advances I mean it's strange but even with child labor and uh, the motion and commotion and all the disease and other factors that you could have in a city life expectancy increases so that's a good thing but market production fuels this agricultural innovation as well that makes the standard of living a little bit better and health better because you're going to get better quality foods um, especially coming from new markets like the new world and from the americas but guilds had largely disappeared it's these little guilds that you would join to i don't know like a lollipop guilds maybe mr Duez. well something like that but these are groups that would learn a trade um, now you're gonna go work for a company and they're gonna teach you how to run a machine and tell you when this green light comes on you're gonna do this and when the red light comes on you're gonna do that and push the button when this happens and clear the jam over here when this happens to the spool and you know cart these uh, newly smelted you know iron ore parts in this wheelbarrow down the, the track and get it to the other end. I mean, it is a monotonous, very uh, physically demanding set of jobs here, but there are a ready supply of industrial workers that have few other options. This reminds me a lot of the Roman Empire as it was expanding and growing. It loses its touch with the Roman uh, Republic, and what the foundation of the Roman Republic was was farming, and um, those independent farmers who had an independent spirit and wanted to not have a king. Well, when the more wealthy factions in Rome sort of buy up all the farmlands, and that's not the, exactly the same thing that's happening here, but there is a forced po uh, um, population uh, out, uh, out of the rural areas and into cities like Rome, and their population just explodes. And there are problems there for sure um, but there are also opportunities for work and as we said earlier in the, the last presentation there's some good opportunities to work and to make a decent living and much more than they were making on the farm so the last bullet point there said British uh, reach here is worldwide and you can see the blue there is sort of like I think it's you know this is in a different language but I like the look of it. I mean, I'm sure it's not even accurate because if you look at the map of Africa there, 
and even and I know what Texas should look like and that doesn't quite look like Texas over here um, but this gives you a sense of they're trying to measure the amount of commerce or trade or ships not even sure what it is but just gives you a sense of where the center of this is and it sure does look like it's in in Europe and um, I think it's indicative of probably how things were looking at that point uh, British political life encourages this commercialization and economic innovation we talked about this a little bit in the first presentation that a unified internal market thanks to road and canal systems and then rail systems leads to uh, all this innovation happening because you can sort of industrialize the process one plant can make one thing here in the northern part of Great Britain and they can ship it down in a rail car or canal to another uh, factory or a place of industry and they can add on to that you put the parts together you, you, you kind of understand how that works I'm, I'm sure but there's another reason that uh, and it's the political life it's it's what the fabric of their their uh, nation is being able to create with and they had checks on the king's power certainly on royal authority and that that happened much earlier in the game with um, the Grand Charter the Great Charter uh, the Magna Carta but this has continued to erode any royal power in, in England and patent laws are gonna further create opportunities for private investors and private enterprises enterprise uh, uh, folks they're going to do this by protecting your uh, invention so if say you create a new way to manufacture a certain part a nut a bolt um, some kind of a, a I don't know it could be something to do with the rail cars that are gonna be pulling coal you could file for a patent for that invention and so someone's if they want to use it they're gonna have to pay you money to um, have the use of it this system is super important it's an official document it gives a person or a company the right to be the only one that makes or sells a product for a certain time this is a copyright on you know protecting someone's intellectual property and this is exceptional in the world at this point and Great Britain is leading the way in it investors uh, are going to give you money if they think you're the one that can use this technology and if not someone may not want to invest in you uh, because somebody else might come along to steal that idea so inventors are frequently able then to get returns on from obtaining intellectual property rights and then if someone infringes upon those you could take them to court um, the patent system was evolving and responding to the needs of this new industrialized economy that doesn't happen in other places in the world another big point here is the population density starts to really pack in into the big cities cities like Manchester which is up here in you know kind of northern England and we say it's northern England because Scotland's above it uh, places like uh, Derby uh, Stafford Birmingham, Gloucester, uh, Bristol, Plymouth, these are in Southampton. These are all along this corridor here that you can tell has 150 to 800 people per square mile. And you see a little bit of the same thing down here in London. Of course, we know London today. That's a pretty seriously uh, big city. But Manchester at this time is growing rapidly because uh, cotton. Uh, <clears throat> manufacturing location it's a a place where heavy machinery is starting to get done and if you see here the difference between early industrial revolution revolution and then right before world war one which starts in 1914 I've got the green box there centered around that corridor that center part there but you can also see a great number of people have increased uh, in the lower part there of uh, of England so uh, where London is so this gives you just an idea of the population increase number one they're able to live longer number two they are able to have a healthier con healthier conditions when they're having children there's better health care options certainly than there were 
if you're on the farm and someone's injured or hurt or has a disease or something, you have more, uh, potentially there's more wealth involved to be able to take care of some people. I'm sure it's nowhere near as good as our healthcare system is today, but uh, yeah, that's not always great either. Still, in relation to where things were, this is a pretty good improvement for them. Now, we, we're talking still a little bit here about why Great Britain might have been able to push through and, and uh, break through as the place where the Industrial Revolution began. And another uh, set of reasons here is, and we'll delve into a little bit more in this slide, is the scientific revolution, because it's different in Great Britain than it is in some other places like in France. On the continent, France, or some other countries, logic, deduction, mathematical reasoning is pretty important and I think these things fall along the lines of more enlightenment type thought processes and maybe falls a little less in terms of science maybe more thinking uh, is being done in terms of things like at least at least into the industrial revolution uh, government roles in government things like natural rights things that the uh, the, the French took care of and, and were involved with with the early parts of the revolution. But in Britain, it's observation, it's experimentation, it's that scientific method. Not just deducting and reasoning and thinking it out, but testing it and saying, I have this theory and I'm going to make sure it works or fails, which is mostly what you're trying to do is make sure you can tell that it's not going to work and then you scratch it off the list. But mechanical devices and then those have practical applications you can make something out of that or you can deduce that you could create a steam engine like the one below there called the rocket which was like the fastest vehicle on the planet at when it was developed in britain artisans and craftsmen inventors were able to work in close contact with these scientists and entrepreneurs and they founded the the British Royal Society 1660 of course that's before the Industrial Revolution but this took the role of promoting useful knowledge and promoting really uh, an industry off of science you see Isaac Newton there who's maybe the greatest scientist of all time right up there with uh, the likes of Isaac Newton I really like this graphic I don't know where I found it but it kind of shows the names of these scientists uh, even like people like Marco Polo and Columbus, which you know, I kind of a weird feel with uh, Eratosthenes, um, Aristotle, Hippocrates, Pythagoras, so all the way back to like 550 BC. And these are, you know, people that had an impact on on science it's in some way, shape, or form. And then as you get into the triangle, it goes from 1550 to kind of 1700. And you've got the Royal British Society right there in the middle. Uh, Copernicus and Descartes, Newton and Galileo, uh, Boyle, who worked with gases, Francis Bacon, the scientific method. So these are all people that are um, in the earlier parts of the scientific revolution. And then you have folks like Tull and Diderot, uh, Jackson, certainly Darwin, his name is quite a bit bigger. Alexander Graham Bell and of course Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, some of these guys in the same um, in the same vein. Uh, it's very interesting kind of how that works and how it flows out of there. And I just thought it was a neat graphic. It makes a lot of sense. It just kind of shows you that you know sort of like what you know the quote that was uh, attributed to Newton was he's been able to see further than most because he's been able to stand on the shoulders of giants who've come before him and and that's sort of the idea here with that so another part here and we're almost done looking at why Britain but uh, plenty of coal and iron ore like we've mentioned before and it's often conveniently located it's right there where there is waterways and there's there on a there it's a set of islands there so that it's not that hard to be on near water but Britain's not devastated by war we'll see this happen over and over again the United States of America, World War One, not devastated by war. The population barely changes at all. Mostly Europe is the ones affected by that. Definitely World War Two. There's only one battle that happens over one day uh, on any American territory, and that's in Hawaii. Uh, very little loss of life for Americans compared to the rest of the world. And so they come out of the wars uh, of the 20th century pretty strong. 
in that regard. Britain's in a similar situation here, uh, at least in this time period, because the Napoleonic Wars never kind of reach their shores. Uh, he tries to invade Russia, it's near winter, things don't go well, and uh, that's kind of the beginning of the end for Napoleon. They also mentioned social change was possible without a revolution, so you could go about changing your society without full-blown revolution. The king had limited power to kind of begin the scientific revolution. And there's a religious toleration that was established in 1688 that kind of helped this as well, the Toleration Act. Um, and the break from the Catholic Church that happens as well before this, I think that is also part of it. The Catholic Church is certainly not as strong in, in Great Britain because of the actions of Henry the Eighth and those who follow. But the British government imposed tariffs to protect its businessmen. And I'm not sure we've talked tariffs yet before. So I've got the the tariff um, uh, definition there. A tax imposed on imported goods and services. So these are taxes on things that are being brought in from another country. So how would that help uh, the, the Britons? Well, if you are from Great Britain and you're producing something, you're going to be able to sell it for much cheaper than somebody else from another country. So tariffs are not free trade, ter you know, and even uh, territory. But this does help British um, British in industrialists. Um, and it's also easy for them to form a company, and sometimes that's very difficult in some cases, to do the rigmarole, the paperwork, get everything ready to say, we are a company, and to get investors in involved with you. It kind of favored the industrialites, the industrialists, and it uh, was sort of negative towards the workers. We'll look, look at it here in a little bit. It was very hard to form a workers' union, and they could very easily institute 12 hour work days with like very limited uh, pay. And I love the graphic there at the bottom eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will, which is, you know the rest of the day where you can spend in some leisure time. If you're spending 12 hours a day at work, that makes it hard. It makes it very hard. Sometimes I work too hard. Um, but here's another slide that kind of talks about something else that really helps to propel the Industrial Revolution. And it's, again, it's one of those um, self-perpetuating or self-fulfilling uh, factors here you've got one change that begets another change and it's really hard to see where the beginning is and what in that feedback loop comes first and what's the really the big impact but the railway is made possible by the steam engine and the only reason they have steam engines is they developed those to get the flooding out of the mines where they were making coal and the steam engine ran on coal and as John Green talks about, there, and that's one example of many examples across the Industrial Revolution where there are beneficial reasons to create a new method because it, it helps across the board in all kinds of different ways. But this is an image here depicting the first uh, railway from uh, Liverpool to Manchester, and that's in northern England there. And uh, in 1830, that's going to create quite a railway mania and before that of course you had Stevenson up in the above left top left picture there and um, Andrew Marr goes into that quite a lot in uh, in his video and shows a segment on Stevenson and his amazing locomotion and I love the one scene there where the, the car is going really slow and there's all the people in the coal car and he says never before in human history has more people have more people traveled at such a high rate of speed and they're just kind of chugging along at like five or ten miles an hour it seems like <laughs> in the distance it's going really slow but when you think about how many people were being pulled that's actually kind of a big deal and that had never been done before but analyze the positive and negatives of the industrial revolution was industrialization ultimately good for society well, you could bat this around all day. Certainly there have been people who have moved to the woods and built a log cabin and uh, try to live in, on their own. And I think it's difficult to do. It's, it's kind of like one of those questions where 
it's virtual history you're looking back and saying you know what would happen if we didn't have an industrial revolution you wouldn't be watching this on YouTube I can tell you that right now uh, this is another one of those images that boy sure seems pretty and nice and look at that this is probably the sunset but I think you can tell pretty well here I used to have a, a poor copy of this and I'd show it in, in class projected and kids wouldn't see it as well those are fires coming <laughs> coming from the factories that are going even to what looks like the night because you can see there's a moon right there down there over here you know right there on this side I'll move my cursor it's right here um, so yeah that's the moon right could it be the sun because there's so much cloud cover here it could be it's it could seem very very cloudy it could be during the day um, interesting it's probably either the sun setting or the moon is just coming up or I don't I don't know how to think of it there but this is a tricky image but it gives you a, a good sense here of I think in some cases they didn't know when it was day or night and I know uh, I this didn't happen when I was alive because just before I was alive you know Pittsburgh Pennsylvania was a steel um, capital of the world really it was a big steel uh, producing place uh, through into the 1970s and then things started going a little bit sour which is ironic because that's when the steelers started to win after 40 years of losing uh, the steel industry went downhill and steelers football team did pretty well which is ironic but I didn't live through the days of like the heavy smog terrible smoke and uh, horrible Pittsburgh haze uh, of conditions that uh, people have talked about. And I can't imagine what it would be like to live in a place where there's that much smoke. Like, if you ever follow a car and their exhaust, maybe it's an older car, and their exhaust is just belching out this just horrible smell. That was every car when I was a kid. So things have improved remarkably, yet there are more cars. So we better improve that and there are ways that you can do almost zero emissions from a car today with uh, virtually zero with an electronic vehicle although you've got to create the electronic uh, the, the energy at some point to get into um, an electrical current but another good example of kind of like a chalky mess and this is in some ways just art so let's look at the workers and how they had to perform the things that they had to do. And the idea here is to make men into machines that cannot err. That was the saying of the day. It was like uh, industrialists are trying to say, okay, we've made these machines great. Can we make men kind of work in the same way? The ironic part about this is that's not a man. That's a, that's a child. And that's what you'll see in this image is there's this child at the bottom. He seems very out of place. And this is in England, and these guys are swinging very heavy um, you know the big huge uh, jackhammers and they're sw swinging these things smashing things and he's just kind of sitting there but if you look on his lap it looks like he's got money on his lap so I don't know what's going on there he might, might have had a good payday but there's limited opportunity for education and for children who are expected to work I mean they used to work on the farm and now they're expected to work in the city because there's no farm and employers could pay the, ch the, ch the child less because they aren't an adult and they can't kind of stand up for that. Um, and their productivity was about the same. So there's no need for strength to operate some of these things. And even to carry what he's carrying there, he doesn't look like he's straining very much. Uh, they look like, kind of like tin cans. But since the industrial system was completely new, there were no experienced adult workers. So, hey, this makes it easy bring a child in here teach him how to do it he's not going to talk back to you and say well I don't want to do this you know this job sucks he's not going to say anything like that he's going to get busy and just do it right well if he didn't that's when the beatings would commence wouldn't that be nice not really I don't even want to go there in England and Scotland 1788 two-thirds of the workers in 143 of the water-powered cotton mill plants were described as children and I'm not sure if this is an image from that time period it's probably not it's probably quite a bit later but you get a sense from a lot of these images some of the first photography that was being done 
that being a child worker, uh, not exactly the most fun in the world, although there's a couple smiles on their faces. The young lady in the middle looks like the spawn of the devil. I mean, she looks like she's not had a very good day. Uh, but maybe they're trying to figure out what it is, this camera thing there. This one scares me because I'm not sure if she's, like, maybe not a ghost because it's a little spooky. But the problem here for people would be reaching their hands down underneath machines, pulling things out. That's why the little hands were useful. But the problem was little hands would come back with, like, one less finger. Uh, luckily, that's my finger still there. But here's a, a way of looking at starting age and the current age uh, at the time period of people who worked in factories. Uh, percentage of people so most most kids are going to start when they're under 10 years old my son is now 10 and I can't even fathom or imagine that Aiden would be going to work in a factory for 12 hours a day like but then again maybe you know, it's I wouldn't think anything different of it if that was all there ever was um, children as young as Four were employed, and I that's just sickening to me. Uh, again, a different time period, though, different way of looking at things. But children employed as mule scavengers by cotton mills, these are people who would crawl under machines and pick up the cotton 14 hour days, six days a week. Some lost hands, limbs, and others were crushed by the machine, and some decapitated. So, that's that's not gonna be good. Uh, some of these images though are, are kind of amazing and I, I've, I've gone and trying to update some of these and find some of these. I found one here that was one I had been using for a long time but the image was kind of blurry. And this is a really good look at these kids I've been looking at for years every time I teach this and uh, beatings and long hours were common. I mean they would whip the kids sometimes or you know spank them and definitely yell and uh, demean them but they would work sometimes from 4 a.m. until 5 p.m. Now here is a little tip for you. If you go back in time to this time period and you're gonna work in the coal mill, maybe let them know that like in a coal mill, or coal mine, sorry, that this thing at the top, you know, that, that's a flame. And each one of these, I don't understand. Wow. I mean, and you may not realize, but there's like gas leaks down there. Uh. I, I, I'm get that's got to be a flame, right? Because I see smoke coming out of it. Conditions were dangerous. <laughs> Some children were killed. And they dozed off, fell asleep in the path of the carts. Others died from the gas explosions. Yeah, because it's going to be freaking explosion because they've got freaking flames coming out of their heads. Like, what are they doing? Many children developed lung cancer and other diseases. This is depressing. So. Obviously, there was social commentary about this. People were not very happy about it. And so the new system of old slavery is what you get here. A bitter cartoon from The Punch. I think it's a British uh, publication, 1842, showing the luxury enjoyed by the rich contrasted there by kind of this uh, subterranean uh, slavery that's happening there. And I, I think it's nice. These little angels are on the side looking up there, taking care of things. But, yeah, it's not a good situation uh, in the earliest days of the Industrial Revolution, it gets somewhat better. We'll talk about socialism down the road. There's some socialist movements that kind of push things in a, maybe a better direction for workers. Uh, maybe it evened up the, the playing field some as far as conditions were concerned. But Britain had a ready supply of capital, and that's money to invest. And how'd they get the money? Well, colonies first, and then wealthy entrepreneurs are eager to find ways to invest and make profits they have abundant natural resources we've talked about before and now a supply of markets to sell these products to uh, because it's colonial empire and the empire only increases and you see here that this is in 1770 before 1776 so what's going to happen there in Philadelphia and Boston and everything in the 13 colonies is is going to is going to change here in just a few years but this gives you a brief look at kind of where they were at the orange there with uh, Canada and the United States, which becomes the United States, 13 colonies, the Bahamas, and you see some orange here uh, at the bottom uh, stretching up towards the Indian Ocean. And, of course, French and Dutch and Spanish, the purple, 
in there and we've looked at this before so you kind of have a good idea of it and you see some of the products being traded as well the colonial empire really goes crazy and now you see it's Canada 13 colonies well I think what this is showing is all the places that become or were a part of the British colonial empire at one time and it's a pretty it's a pretty massive amount of land territory um, and they are the ones who really push this thing forward of course the world wars are going to change that a little bit and uh, the United States comes to become much more powerful this is an ad that says the industrial revolution's over the information age has ended and the bottom part which you might not see is it says welcome to the ideas generation I think that is true the power station London but they may be talking about a different kind of power and in many ways it's the intellectual power today the it's a new age of reason or new age of ideas with the internet age here's a young man that we'll talk about later on down the semester with with India and coming up soon chapter 23 is, is devoted quite a lot to, to Gandhi but he said this in, in industrialization is a curse for mankind kind of an interesting take on this he also said the machine produces much too fast it's just not the proper way to do it and so one of the things he would do is this weaving uh, with the spinners that he had there to create um, to create uh, cloth but he didn't start out that way and he had a British education you see him there and the, actually this image is interesting because it's him in South Africa here sitting in the chair and it's MK Gandhi which is him uh, attorney so he was an attorney of law very intelligent but he became this nationalist Indian nationalist spiritual leader who guides his country to independence and we'll learn much more about him down the road but his thoughts uh, were uh, put in to the first part of this chapter by Strayer and I th thought that was a good good choice to do looking at world population here that's an AP type of question you can see world population questions off of a graph quite often but the impact of the industrial revolution is pretty hard to comprehend just in terms of population that's a way that you can say it was a big impact um, because there's no you know before the 1700s there's no industrial revolution and population had been kind of stable at a billion or so um, and then boom two billion and then boom it just keeps climbing and today we're at nine and a really interesting thing is we're sort of leveling off and you can see the start of that up here but it's leveling off some and actually uh, world population may be in some um, in some better shape than you would think of course the United States and other places this is a slide I've had in here for a while like just thinking about what's in your house or what's in your room uh, right now or your car or wherever you're watching this what is not made by industrial processes it's almost impossible to find things that aren't uh, it, it really is difficult and you can even say humans well humans aren't made by industrial processes well don't count the drugs that you've taken when you've gotten sick uh, don't count the hospital where you were born because that was kind of an industrialized process in many ways uh, so just kind of be careful where you're at there today it seems like the whole world in many ways is processed whether it's our energy our drinking water uh, or whatever there's a really good clip on uh, YouTube uh, a think big clip and it has to do with uh, kind of hearkening back to the Star Trek days where they could put something in this machine and it would re recombine the atoms to create whatever you'd want and what kind of world that would bring us um, Micho Kaiko I think is the, is the scientist who discusses it but there are all kinds of positive aspects of the in age of industry and Mrs. Duez's phone is there on the, the, the right the 2014 uh, edition of the Motorola X which she loves it it's been a good phone for her mine's the 2013 one and I like it quite a lot I can just twist my camera and what do I get I'm gonna take a picture I'll take a picture right here isn't that awesome and it is great it's pretty cool to be able to take a picture um, out of nowhere and and do that just by twisting my wrist and popping just tapping the screen technology is pretty amazing and there's a lot of good about it but there is a lot of uh, negative as well 
So I'm going to look at some negative factors, and this is also going to talk about population, which is a key thing for AP world history. Also, this is good to just be thinking about as a human being on the planet. World population, we, sh we saw that just jump up off the, the graph there. But along with that, there has been a tremendous amount of metric tons of carbon produced by the burning of fossil fuels, gas, oil, coal, and that's led to a huge increase, like the same kind of increase with uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide. Hans Rosling, if you've never seen him before, you should check this out. I'm going to try to show one of these in class this week. But he is a global health data expert from Sweden, and he's pretty famous for this, the joy of stats uh, that aired on the BBC in, in 2010. And all his little video segments are, are pretty interesting. This one in particular, it's like uh, kind of uh, computerized. You can see the dots moving with uh, population and, uh, or not population, income and uh, lifespan. So uh, he shows like how things have changed. And this is another good example. If you think t things are terrible today and this, yeah, this uh, Obama, you know, <laughs> whatever you want to say, you get upset about the, the current state of affairs in the world. And sometimes it does seem like it's pretty crazy. You want to go back and live another time period? Because this says no. This says things are better now. However, it won't be better if the planet's not inhabitable. And we see some trends here that are scientifically valid and backed by statistics, and it continues to show the same kind of patterns. You see the El Nino and La Nina years. I really like this one because you can tell the difference with that. Here lately, we've had some different uh, phases with that that caused the, the, the drought that you may not have remembered, but we had about a two-year drought here in Houston. But this is also looking at carbon dioxide variations, and the one that's very interesting is this where you see that big jump up here again, right about the Industrial Revolution, boom. And global temperatures. The average, uh, the annual average, and it's jump, it jumps up and down, like you would expect it to do. The five-year average is more of like right in the middle of that. So it gives you a sense. Yeah, there's some dips and starts, but boy, from 1980, and from my lifetime from 1970 to 2000, it has gone up and up and up, and 2014 was the hottest year ever on record. Uh, this is atmospheric carbon dioxide from the Law Dome ice cores. So they pull these ice cores, and they can look and see how much of a concentration of carbon dioxide it has in them. These are ice cores that you know are forced down into the ground, and they pull out a cylinder of ice, and they can see in the core. It's like almost like looking at tree rings. And you can tell that there's this huge increase right after the Industrial Revolution with carbon dioxide in the air. That's just one of the ways you can look at it. And world population, of course, remember that's going up and up and up. This is just real-time air quality in the index visual map, which is pretty amazing that you can do this. First of all, you can get it on the computer, go to, the, go to that website and look at it. I looked at it today. And you can, this kind of gives you a hint here of what's happening. These newly industrialized countries of India, which is actually not as bad, but there's certain sections of India that are. But China, holy mackerel, man. I mean, 401 is one of those numbers that, that's read there. And the United States is pretty bad. Mexico City, 108. Uh, Los Angeles area, 129. Um, the Houston area on this day is not as bad as it usually is because it's winter time. You get in the summertime, there will be some red numbers on there for certain. Uh, this is interesting to look at, and it will flow into what Hans Rosling talks about in this quick video clip. And these are like three or four minutes long. They're really worth watching just to understand it. But he talks about the dynamics of population growth, child mortality, and carbon dioxide emissions and tries to explain that the real challenge for the future is going to be to get the poor out of extreme poverty, increase their living conditions, and then get the richest people in the world, the industrialized nations, to use less fossil fuels so that there will be more energy that could be shared to support the population. Because what he also shows in some other videos is when you support a growing and developing country 
and they have some industrialized processes and education to one of those healthcare hospital hospitals to you know help the, the poor and stuff you get much more standardized uh, lifespan and you don't have as big a population spike in those places because in the industrialized world we're not having as many children you know why they have so many children in non-industrialized and developing nations because they lose children sometimes to disease and they also feel like they need kids to help work kinda like we were talking about earlier and so uh, Hans is somebody who Han is somebody who is interesting to listen to because he's very positive about the future if we can take certain steps. He's really a, a bright individual and he has a really neat style. So if uh, if you're not in my class and you're watching this, I would definitely recommend checking him out. This is something else that you know not on the test as we've been talking about here, but also fairly interesting. This is the largest uh, calving ever caught. On camera and this is when ice is breaking away and a pretty amazing uh, documentary was done called Chasing Ice and it won the 2012 Sundance Film Festival Award and the best documentary in international press it's won like 30 other awards you should definitely check out the uh, trailer for it I didn't link for it here but you can just search for Chasing Ice but this is one part of the film that is really amazing like they're sitting there, nothing's happened, nothing's happened, and then everything happens. This big, huge part of the ice uh, breaks apart about this big ice, ice sheet breaks apart. So you can kind of see, and when you're looking at this, and you look at you know, time-appropriate data for the time of the, the, the climate of that seasons and everything, but you can tell like where the ice is, and they can look at thickness of it and things. But from 1902 to 2001 is that... Uh, time period where the ice has kind of been melting from uh, in 1902 the Industrial Revolution had been going on for a while and one of the things to remember here with that is CO2 doesn't dissipate within a lifetime I mean it's going to be in the atmosphere for way longer so everything that gets put in there gets built up and sure there can be some dissipation in some different ways and it can be kind of soaked up in other ways but all things being equal, when you keep adding to it, it's going to have an, imp an impact. And this is what they're showing here is a 2002, 2003, 2004, 2006, and then they go into the future in 2010, because I don't think this was, a, this might have been in 2010, so you have a date on this, 2008 winter. So they were looking into the future probably as far as like um, even 06, 06, 06, 09, and 10. But really interesting and these are just images this shows the amount of ice that had dissipated in 100 years and then it is exceeded by an area bigger than the 100 years over just a 10 year period so maybe that puts into perspective here what we're talking about this is creating a change in our climate it doesn't necessarily have to be a warming climate wherever you're living it could be what this definitely shows you, and I probably should have learned this in, in uh, geography, and if you have, we can have a better discussion about it, but this would probably create water levels across the planet, which would be a great deal higher. And this is the last thing on the slides, and it's just kind of fun. This is a little uh, video called uh, Industrial Re Revolutions, but it's about a cyclist named Danny McGaskill, and uh, he rides his bike his uh, bicycle through an old uh, industrialized part of uh, of Great Britain. It's pretty amazing. Kind of fun couple minutes if you have some time. But for the test, I would definitely be thinking about why it was that the Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain. And think about all those factors that kind of led to that. We're also going to look here in this chapter at the revolutions that have spun off because of industry and during this time period, a good example is Mexico. And uh, we'll talk some about that this week, leading up for the t to the test on 17 and 18. So I will see you next time. Just remember, don't forget to be awesome.